Welcome, everybody. I'm Suresh Srinivasan. I'm the coordinator for the Minnesota Astronautical Society's uh, Beginner Special Interest Group. Um, I'm going to present today a topic that everybody likes. It's deep sky objects. We're going to talk about the different kinds of deep sky objects, um, the, the, the differences between them, uh, potentially how you can see them yourself, and a few other aspects. Uh, this is geared towards beginners, as this is the beginner group, but um, I think there's some content in here that some intermediate people, maybe uh, one or two advanced people might find interesting. Um, we're probably going to go over two hours, just so you know. Uh, the last time I did this presentation, three or four years ago, I think we were about 2.20. So just know that. Um, and to speed things up, I'm going to ask that if you've got questions, and, and I know we usually get really good questions from our group, uh, please use the chat feature in Zoom. And Matt uh, will ping me every, what, five minutes or so um, if there's questions and I can answer them then. It just flows more smoothly then and helps me keep my frame of thought. Um, so the other thing too, is if you don't mind, keep your computers on mute when you're not uh, speaking, which is going to be most of the time here and also turn off the video, um, screen. So I think that saves bandwidth and makes things, uh, less likely to crash or, or what have you. Um, so before I get started, just real quick, any questions from the group or anything? All right, let's get started. All about deep sky objects. So what is a deep sky object? Uh, just to start off, uh, the way I define it is a deep sky object is, can be any object that's outside of the solar system. Technically stars are deep sky objects, uh, though we don't think of them usually that way. We think of things like nebulae or galaxies or star clusters, uh, things like that. Uh, but these days there are other things that are, that are new to the list like exoplanets, for example, something that even a decade ago we wouldn't have even known about, but now these are deep sky objects that are that are holding astronomers' attention quite closely. Uh, astronomers tend to use the term deep sky objects to describe objects that are unusual looking, uh, large, and usually very far away. Uh, normally these are objects that uh, are you do require a telescope or at least binoculars to see, but not always. Sometimes you can see some of these objects with your eyes and we'll cover a few of those as we go through this. So the purpose of this presentation is We'll go through each type of deep sky object to help us understand how these objects formed, what their characteristics are. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, we'll look at some examples that we can see with our own telescopes. This is a slide that I like to start off with. Uh, it's a little bit busy, I know, but it's an important slide. And what it really is, is a depiction of our Milky Way galaxy, uh, say from looking down from above. Our Milky Way galaxy is approximately 120,000 light years from side to side. So basically a diameter of 120,000 light years or so. Uh, there are some differences in the estimates. Some are 110, some are a little bit more than 120. But by and large, the majority of astronomers these days will say about 120,000. Uh, it gives it a radius of about 60,000 light years. Most of the matter that we see, that we have in our galaxy, we cannot see. It's called dark matter. And the only way that astronomers even know that dark matter exists is that without it, there's not enough mass in our galaxy to hold things together the way we, we observe them to be held together. So we won't really cover dark matter. I'm not, a, I'm not very good at describing dark matter anyway, except to say that the only way we know about it is through its gravitational influence. And we'll cover a little bit of that and a little bit later in the talk. Uh, one, of, one of the reasons I like this slide so much is so our galaxy is, is classified as a barred spiral. See how you have the central bar here? We'll cover barred spiral galaxies later, but our galaxy is classified as a barred spiral. We have classical spiral arms in our, in our Milky Way, like we see in other galaxies. Uh, the, some of them have names. So like uh, two of the more prominent ones in our vicinity are the Perseus arm and the Scutum Centaurus arm. And we can even see, uh, through a hole in the Scutum Centaurus arm into the Norma arm uh, in the constellation Sagittarius. And of course, the Sagittarius arm, which is a prominent arm that we see in the summertime sky. Another thing too is, as I mentioned, the sun is right here. The sun is, uh, has been measured to be about 26,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. It's about, uh, about halfway or a little bit more than halfway or so uh, from the core of our galaxy to the edge. 
and so one of the things that you'll notice here is because the, the Perseus arm and the Orion spur, which is the closest segment to us, and then also closer in the Sagittarius arm and all these nebulae um, and globular clusters and the like that you see here, these will block the view uh, from our perspective of things that are behind them. So say we're here, we have trouble looking out here. We have trouble looking over here because there's stuff in between. This is really important and I'll get to that later, but just for now, think of it as for the majority of Milky Way objects, we can only see approximately 6,000 light years uh, until we start running into matter that blocks our view. So this is approximately 6,000 light years, it's approximately 6,000 light years. There are some um, exceptions to that rule, but just think in terms of like, as we go through these deep sky objects and you start to visualize how, our, how they're kind of laid out within our galaxy, think about uh, aspects like uh, matter blocking some of this, uh, from some of these objects from being seen uh, once they get further out than about six or 8,000 light years, give or take. So what is a nebula? More than 100 years ago, um, any deep sky object really could be defined as a nebula. Uh, the term started coming into use right after the telescope as, as astronomers were starting to run into fuzzy objects that they couldn't quite get uh, quite defined. They couldn't quite see them clearly enough. So there were so many of these fuzzies that they just started calling them nebulae. Uh, most, most astronomers at the time presumed these to be um, star clusters, they just couldn't resolve. William Herschel, the discoverer of Uranus, uh, cataloged over 2,500 of these nebulae. Uh, and his son, uh, John, also added that list, as well as his, his uh, sister, uh, Caroline, William's sister, Caroline Herschel. Uh, many of these nebulae turned out to be galaxies once we got better equipment. In more modern times, a nebula is usually defined as a vast cloud of interstellar gases, generally ionized hydrogen and helium. There are several types of nebulae. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna focus on diffuse nebulae. These are vast clouds of interstellar gases, often many light years across. The three main types of diffuse nebulae are emission, reflection, and dark nebulae. And though these nebulae can differ in visibility and visual wavelengths, they are all bright emitters of infrared radiation because of their dust contact, and that's how we can see them. So we'll start off with the mission nebulae, uh, which are one of my favorite, actually. Uh, mission nebulae emit radiation from ionized gases, usually hydrogen and sometimes helium. These are stellar nurseries. So think of these as you see these pictures here. These are areas of gas, vast clouds of gas where baby stars are being born. These baby, these these regions are called H2 or hydrogen 2 regions because of their large amounts of ionized hydrogen. Uh, as amateur astronomers, we can see a lot of these emission nebulae uh, through our telescopes, particularly when you use uh, specialized bandwidth filters, O3, uh, ultra high contrast or UHC, and sometimes hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta actually as well. Uh, these filters block out all but specific lines of hydrogen um, hydrogen and oxygen and some other elements and that these objects have in, in abundance. It makes these objects much more easily visible to us through the telescope. So these are three uh, of the more famous uh, emission nebulae. There's, there's literally hundreds of them, but uh, M16 is called the Eagle Nebula. And by the way, the way I have most of these labeled is uh, have the name, their designation, the constellation they're in, the distance and how wide they are across. So for instance, the Eagle is about 5,700 light years across and it's about 58 light years wide. So from here to here, it's approximately 57, 58 light years. Uh, and some of these create some interesting shapes. So this is the Eagle. Uh, some people can see the Eagle, some people can't. I kind of do, like here are the wings and here's the head. Here's the monkey head. And this one really stands out to me. Uh, it does to me look so much like a monkey. It was an amazing description for that one. The Omega Nebula is this vast cloud, also in Sagittarius, about 4,200 light years away. Uh, the Omega part is right in here. If you can think of it, it looks like a horseshoe. It's been also called the Swan Nebula because when you're zoomed in a little bit, it looks like it has a neck and it looks like a swan. So these are th three of my favorites. Here's a few more. Just a second. 
so the famous Orion Nebula uh, is uh, obviously in Orion. It, it's also designated M42. The M stands for Messier, and we'll cover that a little bit later in the talk. Again, these are all stellar nurseries, and the Orion Nebula is so big because it's so close to us. It's only 1,400 light years away, and though it's only 35 light years across. And keep this in mind because in a minute, I'm going to give you a comparison. So the Orion Nebula through an eyepiece is, is phenomenal especially when you use an O3 filter, the, the detail just pops at you. It's an amazing sight. And again, this is where baby stars are being born. There's actually star clusters usually associated with these objects. Uh, so for example, the cave nebula, many of these stars you see within the nebula or around the nebula actually formed in the nebula. These are generally young, hot blue stars that are just a few million years old. Our sun formed in the emission nebula about 4.6 billion years ago or so. It may have even been a second or third generation star in our area. And so our sun formed in something that looked somewhat like this. And one actually, interestingly, about a month or two ago, I read that astronomers now are trying to find some of the sun's long lost siblings uh, that formed from the same cloud. Uh, over, the, over the eons, as, as our solar system orbited our Milky Way galaxy, we go around, I think, every once every about 250 million years the cluster uh, expanded and then dispersed. So it makes it really hard for astronomers to detect stars that are related to our sun. They're looking at it in terms of their uh, chemical composition, but that might not be an exact science because sometimes within the cloud, some compounds or elements might be more concentrated in one part than the other. Uh, but that's, what, that's an area of, of study right now. It's kind of interesting. So some other ones are the bubble nebula. You can see the bubble right there and the cocoon nebula. Uh, which is in Cygnus, the swan. Hey, Suresh. Yeah. I had missed a message uh, back on the galaxy topic. Uh, uh, Bala asked, is our galaxy flat or a sphere? Because I think from the view you get, you, it's kind of yeah. hard to tell. That's a great question. So it is, I'll say it's relatively flat. We will cover that in great detail in a little bit, but think of it as a flattened disc with a large central bulge. So think of it like a basketball. With, uh, with wings. <laughs> it's probably the easiest way I could think of right now to say it. So think of it like a sphere of matter in the center and then a plane of dust and gas going out uh, in a spiral fashion as you see here. Yeah. I hope that ex answers your question. I kind of view it as like a fried egg. Fried egg, yeah. In a skillet? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, sometimes in astronomy we use some really technical terms as you can see. Um, so another thing about emission nebulae is sometimes they're so large and so bright, we can even see them in other galaxies. And here are two famous um, examples. This is a picture of the pinwheel galaxy called M33 or Messier 33. We're talking, so let me just give you a little context. Here we're talking 1400 light years, 2700 light years, 7,000 light years. Now we're talking 2.8 million light years. And we can see this little glow here is NGC 604. This is a emission nebula that we can see in another galaxy. And one of the reasons we can see that is, look at the size of it. Almost 1,600 light years across, compared with six light years across, 39 light years across, 35 light years across. So some of these can be immense. So 604 is one of my favorite um, objects to look for when I look for this galaxy because it really stands out. And it's amazing to think that we can see a gas cloud from 2.8 million light years away. Another one that's famous is the Tarantula Nebula here in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Unfortunately, this cloud cannot be seen from most of the Northern Hemisphere. You have to trouble, travel to the Southern Hemisphere. But look at the size of the Tarantula, almost 1,900 light years wide. Um, and this is 160,000 light years away. So it's, it's an amazing uh, structure to see through a telescope. Um, and if you ever get a chance to look online, look for pictures of the Tarantula Nebula. It's really amazing. Okay, so Reflection Nebula is the next type of uh, diffuse nebula. So one thing I should say, and I'll probably say this more than once, is the three types of diffuse nebulae, emission, reflection, and dark nebulae, are often found all together combined within, uh, within the same object. Uh, many nebulae have all three, some have two, some, some have one, uh, but it's very common to find more than one type within, um, within a, a nebula structure. 
So re reflection nebulae differ from emission nebulae in that they do not emit their uh, radiation on their own. These are clouds of gas that happen to be near hot, bright stars that then scatter their light. Uh, it's similar in the, in the idea of it as, as to the blue scattering in our atmosphere of nitrogen gas. Uh, so when sunlight comes through, the nitrogen in our atmosphere scatters that sunlight as blue. It's a similar kind of process as what's happening here. The nebulae's color, uh, reflection nebulae's color, uh, emulates the star's color, as well as perhaps the composition of the cloud itself. Uh, and interstellar dust clouds can contain compounds and elements such as, uh, in addition to uh, hydrogen and helium, they also contain carbon, iron, nickel, and other elements. One thing to think about when you look at a, at a nebulae, one thing I try to do is look at their color. The color tells you what it's made up of. So red, that's hydrogen, uh, sometimes nitrogen and sometimes oxygen, but primarily hydrogen. If it gets ruby red, think carbon. And you can see the rest of them, sodium. Yellow could be either helium or you know, yellow gold, it's iron. Uh, as we mentioned, blue is nitrogen. So when you look at a, a nebulae, think in terms of that. The majority of the time it's gonna be red because hydrogen is 99.9996. I think percent of all the elemental uh, elements in the universe by weight, but there are often other elements and other compounds that are visible in nebulae. So another thing to consider is, if you remember in emission nebulae, I mentioned that a lot of the stars are young, hot, and blue. So a lot of reflection nebulae tend to shine blue because of the light from those stars. And here's, here are two examples. So here's the Iris Nebulae in Cassiopeia. The blue that you see here is coming from a star uh, behind it, I guess, that is illuminating the, the shell of gas in, in its blue color. So, um, and you can also see some of the dark nebula here. So that's why this is blue. If you look at the Flaming Star Nebula, what do you see? You see the reddish emission nebula, but you also see this bluish purplish stuff, right? This is the reflection nebula from the star. And this star is called A.E. Origa. And this star has a very interesting story. If you know the constellations, you know that Origa passes almost straight up for us in the, in the winter sky. This star, astronomers have determined, actually formed within the Orion Nebula many, many, many light years away from this cloud. This star formed about 2 million years ago and has been traveling northward across our sky in those 2 million years. It just so happens to be passing through this cloud of gas at this time where it's illuminating it enough that we can see these components. I find that to be really interesting sometimes when uh, chance encounters like that just happen to be happening when we're looking at the object. Here's a couple of more reflection nebulae, two of the more famous ones. The Pleiades star cluster. This is a star cluster that, that's with about one or two million years old. And these are, again, hot, young blue stars that are so young that they're still uh, nourishing on the cloud that formed them. So this is all matter from the, from the primordial cloud that the Pleiades star cluster formed from. And on long exposure photography, we can pull out these, the, these nebula portions. Visually, you can't see these, but photo photographically, it's actually pretty easy to pull these out. And then down here is the famous Trifid Nebula in Sagittarius. Remember I mentioned that a lot of these nebulae have all three components of diffuse nebulae? Well, this is definitely one that stands out. So here you have the red, which is emission nebulae, a lot of hydrogen in here. And you see all these stars in here. These all formed within this component of the trifid. Here's the reflection nebulae, nebula that formed from some of the stars shining light uh, uh, within them. And then you see the dark lanes. These are dark nebulae. The dark nebulae, I'll talk about more in a second, but these are just obscure uh, patches that block our ability to see behind them. Okay, I have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, John okay. asks, is there enough data available for Nebulae to be able to reconstruct a 3D model of it? And I think I know a partial answer on that, so I'll let you go here. I've um, never been asked that question before, but my, <laughs> my answer would be yes. I think that um, astronomers now have techniques that can measure different components of the Nebulae in precise enough detail that they could construct a 3D map out of that. I think, I think it's a, that's a basic answer to that. 
What yeah. do you think, Matt? Well, I think the example I think of is that people have been doing 3D printing of Eta Carina. I, uh, might be worth looking that up. I'll check while I've got a minute here. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, I'll keep going then. Uh, so dark nebulae, the third and final component of diffuse nebulae. These are really vast. Uh, there are so many dark nebulae in our in our visual universe that I'm not even sure if they've, they've cataloged all of them. These are vast clouds of gas that contain a high concentration of dust and gases that block the light from objects behind them. The largest dark nebulae can extend more than 500 light years and contain a million solar masses of matter within them. These are called molecular clouds. Uh, and some famous examples of dark nebulae are the Horsehead Nebula. See the horse's head right here? This is an Orion. And the coal sack in, in Crux is, is amazing visual. You can just look up in the sky and see this hole in the Milky Way, which is where the coal sack is. And it's simply blocking our ability to see behind it. And there's other ones called, for example, the pipe and uh, snake nebulae in Ophiuchus. Uh, within our Milky Way galaxy, uh, within the Sagittarius star cloud, which is in the direction of the center of our galaxy, there's M24, which is this amazing star cloud. It's through an eyepiece, through a telescope, this is thousands of stars. It's it's wall-to-wall -wall stars. It's, it's like being in the city to me is the way I feel about it. It's about 10,000 light years away. In the in the star cloud is a gap that formed that gives us the ability to see a little bit behind it. That's what these stars are. These stars were actually further away than some of the foreground. So we can actually see approximately 10,000 light years away in a cloud that is about 4,000 light years away, if I remember correctly. But within that, there's this really big dark nebulae that blocks light from behind it. So this gap is about 650 light years across within our Milky Way. And it stands out. You can look up in the sky and see this gap. So if you go out into the country on a clear moonless night in the summertime with the Milky Way high above, you look up there, you will see a myriad of dark nebula from north to south throughout the Milky Way. It's an amazing sight. And if you're under truly dark skies, it can be awe-inspiring to see that. And I hope that everybody's had a chance to have done that at least once in their life. So any questions about nebulae? And before I leave nebulae. Okay, one thing I should mention, I should have said this in the beginning, the way I constructed this presentation is we're gonna talk about things that are pertaining to birth. And then we're gonna talk about things that are, you wanna call them living. And then we're gonna talk about death. And these are three components of the universe that are found in deep sky objects. So everything we've talked about so far within the emission nebulae, the reflection nebulae, dark nebulae, these are all areas that young stars are being formed or are just starting to uh, light up their surroundings. So I think of this as nebulae as areas of, of uh, star birth and star creation uh, or rebirth from prior uh, stars that went supernova, for example, and are starting over again. So everything we've talked about so far, think of it as uh, the youth of the universe in terms of New, new stars, new clusters, new nebulae. Now, now we're going to get into the living, which is open clusters. Yeah, Sorry, Matt, do you have a question? Yeah, I did. I, we did get a question from Steve. Are the particles of a nebula atoms, molecules, bits of sand, or all of these? All of the above. Uh, you will have elements. Uh, you will have compounds. Um, <clears throat> remember, a lot of this, uh, everything that is in our sun today came from a nebula that formed it. And also any, everything that we have on the earth today came from the nebula that formed it. So all the iron, all the compounds, the natural compounds, uh, all the heavier elements, the rare earth, for example, all that came from a, a cloud of gas almost 5 billion years ago. So hopefully that answers your question. Can you respond, Matt? Uh, it seems like you did. Okay, great, I'll keep going. So open clusters are defined as a group of stars, uh, sometimes up to a few thousand, that, same from, that form from the same molecular cloud. These stars are often the same age and composed of the same compounds and are still held together very loosely by gravity. Uh, young open clusters like the Pleiades we mentioned earlier 
will still contain some of the residual gas from the cloud that formed them. Sometimes uh, when clusters are young like the Pleiades, uh, the young hot stars can light up the nebula from within. I think of it as being um, in a lantern, like a gas lantern, where the flame is being lit up by the gas inside of it, and it could shine in different colors. Typically, these are blue, as I mentioned earlier, because young hot stars are typically blue in color. So here's some examples of open clusters, the Pleiades. M52 is a beautiful one in Cassiopeia. It's about 4,600 light years away. Here's three other ones, Caroline's Rose. So I mentioned briefly earlier, William Herschel, who was the astronomer who discovered the planet Uranus. His sister uh, was his note taker and secretary, uh, Caroline, but she also turned out to be one of the more famous astronomers in history in her own right. She discovered several comets, I think seven comets in, in her life and multiple deep sky objects. And this is one of them. This is a very rich, beautiful open cluster in the constellation Cassiopeia. It's called NGC 7789, but it's also been called Caroline's Rose. When she saw it, she thought it looked like it had petals like a rose. I don't really see it, but she seems to have thought this looked like a rose. I don't know if you guys think it does. Uh, it's a very pretty cluster. And if you have a chance sometime under um, a reasonably dark, dark sky with a telescope, try to find this one. It's pretty easy to find in Cassiopeia. Another very easy pair of open clusters to find is the double cluster. This cluster under a dark sky is actually visible to the unaided eye. It's, uh, it's in the Milky Way between the constellations of Cassiopeia and Perseus. And you just look up and you can see it. And what these are are two open clusters that just happen to be along the same line of sight um, to us. Uh, one is a little bit closer than the other. One is 6,800 light years across and the other one's about 9,600 light years across. But together, uh, they, they appear in the same eyepiece field. So they look like they're almost identically, uh, you know, they're twins. It's almost as if they formed right next to each other, but it's an optical illusion. One is a little bit further than the other, but these are a gorgeous pair in, a, in, a, in a, uh, any telescope, even binoculars. This is wonderful to look at in the summertime sky. If you guys come out to a BSIG event this summer, uh, I'll be sure to show this to you. The next group of objects is called globular clusters. I think of these as star cities. And these are a very dense group of stars. Remember we, we talked about open star clusters as being very loosely organized. Over time, these will dissipate. The gravity won't be strong enough to hold them together. And they'll kind of spread out uh, you know, amongst the surroundings and then go their own way. Globular clusters don't break apart. They are very dense. They're held together strongly by gravity and they tend to be very spherical in shape. Uh, whereas we talked about open star clusters being uh, a few, maybe a few hundred to maybe a few thousand stars. Some globulars may have even a million stars. So we're talking about a whole different order of magnitude. Another thing too, I wanna make sure I, I explain here is remember when we talked about When we talk about open clusters, we're talking about them primarily as being within the spiral arms of our galaxy. That's where a lot of them tend to be. And because of that, remember we talked about that limit of about 6,000 light years away that we can see, because otherwise the Milky Way's arms will obscure what's behind them. Globular clusters tend to be in these pockets that we can see further away uh, out towards galaxies that aren't obscured as much by local dust. So to explain a little bit more clearly, Remember with open clusters, we're talking you know, 430 light years away, 4,600 light years away. And this one's almost 10,000 light years away, but the most of them are within that same distance, right? Now we're starting to get a little bit further away. Globular clusters, look at this, 17,000 light years away, 15,000 light years away. So we're starting to look out a little bit further into the universe. Uh, and that's where these globular clusters tend to congregate. Uh, one thing you should know is that uh, globular clusters tend to be more concentrated in the center, as it kind of looks like here. Um, away from the core, the average gap in some of these clusters is about a light year between stars. So a light year is about six trillion miles. So these stars out here are on average about a trillion miles apart, about a light year. 
But once you get into the core, they can be as close together as 0 0.05 light years apart, which is about the width of our, our solar system. So these can be really densely concentrate, concentrated in the center. Um, and uh, there may be instances where there could be planets within stars closer to the core that may not really ever see darkness because of the concentration of stars in, in, this, in this part of the, of the cluster. The vast majority of globulars, as I mentioned a second ago, orbit their halos around, orbit in halos around their parent galaxies. Um, and galaxies can have hundreds of globular clusters, maybe sometimes thousands. The Milky Way has about 150 globular clusters that we've discovered so far. Now, again, we can't see the far side of the galaxy because it's obscured, but from what we've detected so far, there's been about 150. Some giant elliptical galaxies, on the other hand, like for, for example, M87, which is a galaxy in Virgo, has 13,000 globular clusters that have been detected to date. So uh, there's a vast discrepancy in the number of globulars that you can see uh, per galaxy. Uh, and another thing too is sometimes these globulars interact with the galaxy in a way that the galaxy kicks them out. So we call these intergalactic wanderers. And there's two famous uh, galaxies, uh, NGC 7606 and NGC 2419 that are called intergalactic wanderers. And these, get, these globulars are on the order of 100 and, 150 to 200,000 light years away from us. And they're leaving our galaxy. They're in the process of actually literally leaving our galaxy. Another interesting thing about globular clusters Remember we talked about open clusters being uh, a few million years old, you know, one, two, uh, sometimes they're five million years old. After that, the stars tend to, to disperse and go their own way. Globular clusters stay together and they could, they're some of the most ancient objects in our universe. Many of them are in the order of 10 to 12, 13 billion years old. And that's because their stars are very long lasting. They long ago gave up the, the, the gas that, that creates new stars. They, these are gas uh, devoid objects. And these stars tend to be small yellow stars that can last for billions of years, billions and billions of years. So for example, I know Omega, uh, Omega itself is an interesting object, Omega Centauri. They, they, so astronomers believe that this was a former core of another galaxy that the Milky Way devoured, you know, maybe a billion or two years ago. Uh, and, this, uh, and this core may be upwards of 10 billion years old. The last thing about globular clusters is they're classified according to their concentration, whereas class ones tend to be the most concentrated, and whereas class uh, 12, I think it is, is the least concentrated, the most uh, spread out. Here are three of the, mo of the Northern Hemisphere's best globular clusters. Here's M13 and Hercules, which is a wonderful object to see in the summertime. You can see this from a dark sky. I, I've seen this with my naked eye. Binoculars bring it out very clearly. And then obviously through a telescope, it looks, it literally looks like this through a telescope. It's what, globular clusters are very interesting in that whether you see them on photographs or through a telescope, they generally appear closely to what they look like on a photograph. So if you look through a nice, a good telescope from dark sky, M13 will look basically like this. Uh, M3 will look a lot like this, and M15 will look like this. So again, we're talking distances, right? So uh, M13 has, is about 23,000 light years away. M3 is about 33,000, and M15 about 34,000 light years away. Uh, the other thing too is, um, remember we talked about open clusters having a few thousand stars. M13, 300,000 stars. Uh, M15, 100,000 stars. M3, over 500,000 stars. Omega Centauri has maybe 10 million stars. So we're starting to get into objects that are more, uh, more uh, dense with stars. And again, these are very old stars and very old objects. Any questions about globular clusters? Nothing from anyone else at this point, but I actually had one. Do you, do you recall, are there typically uh, thought to be black holes in the middle of the globulars? Yes, that's actually a good question. Uh, not in all. Uh, astronomers have detected uh, what they think the signs of black holes in some globular clusters. I think they believe there's one in uh, Omega Centauri. And I think I read that they, that they found one at, or they detected one, the, the, 
symptoms of one in M13, but not in every one. Not they haven't they haven't come to that conclusion yet. Okay, no, else? nothing else at this point. Okay. Oops, hold on. <laughs> All right. So Mike says you mentioned exotic binary systems on the last slide. What are those? Binary systems. Oh, I think he's talking about this. Um, so 47 Tucana, I should back up again. Uh, so as a visual observer, I, one of my favorite things to say is the Southern Hemisphere has all the best objects. There's a lot of objects that we can't see from the Northern Hemisphere that they just get. They just go out and see them and it makes me very angry. These are two of the best ones. Omega Centauri, which is the best globular cluster in the sky. It's the, it's the size in the sky of two full moons, or actually four full moons side by side, is the, is the area of the sky that this object covers. 47 Tucana is the second best globular cluster in the sky. And to answer your question uh, about the binary systems, they found uh, examples of uh, binary star systems within this globular that give off X-ray emissions. Uh, it's, I believe, the only globular to have that distinction. They don't quite understand the dynamics that are going on, but it's something that they're studying, and it's something that's really interesting. Hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions, Matt? Not at this point. Okay. This is one of my favorite pictures I've seen in recent years. It was, it was taken by Dave Venny, one of our MAS members, a few years ago, with actually a very small telescope. This is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, which many of you have heard of. What he did was he went and looked and he found that within this image, taken with a small telescope, he found 26 globular clusters inside the halo of the Andromeda galaxy. And he marked them like, like such. Uh, the reason I include this is to, is to prove to you that globular clusters do reside in the halos of their parent galaxies. They tend to congregate kind of in the middle of all the gas that's swirling around the galaxy. And indeed, a lot of our globulars in the Milky Way tend to also reside in the halo, the central halo of our galaxy. And I just think this is the coolest image. These, all these little tiny little dots are globular clusters that are 2.2 million light years away. And we can see them. I just find that amazing. Okay. So we've, we've now ended the, the birthing and living parts of our discussion. So remember we talked about the diffuse nebulae as essentially star forming regions. Uh, I like to think of them as areas of, of uh, renewal and rebirth within our universe. Then we came across open clusters and globular clusters, which are to me, stars that are living. Uh, you know, our sun was formed in an open cluster. Um, and is, is in the middle of its uh, approximately 5 billion, or uh, maybe 8 billion year life cycle. Uh, now we're going to start talking to, about things that happen when stars are about to die. And I apologize that a few of these slides are a little bit more wordy. I'll try to explain them a little more easily. But the first thing we're going to talk about is planetary nebulae, which are fascinating objects that we can see through our telescopes. So remember we talked about emission nebulae or regions where baby stars are being born. Planetary nebulae are objects formed from the ashes of dying small and average sized stars. They form when stars that are roughly 0.8 to 8 solar masses are done converting hydrogen into helium uh, via nuclear fusion um, at a core temperature of about 15 million degrees Kelvin. Over lifetimes of millions or billions of years, these stars happily burn through their hydrogen in what's called the main sequence phase. Our sun is about halfway through its main sequence phase right now. But once the star burns through the hydrogen, things start to change. With the weakened outward force of pressure, gravity starts to win the battle. Let me restate that. When you look at a star, either to a telescope or even when you, when you shouldn't look at our sun, but if you were to peer at our sun, what you're really seeing is a battle between the outward force of, of pressure formed by, uh, caused by the nuclear reaction in the, in the core of the sun, pushing out um, this, uh, this wave of matter, fighting against the inward force of gravity. And the sun right now is in equilibrium between the outward force of pressure and the inward force of gravity 
into the star that we see today, which is uh, the same size relatively from day to day. It's not expanding, it's not contracting. Um, but once, once the sun burns through its hydrogen, this, the outward force of pressure will start to lose the battle against gravity. Gravity will start to compress the core. And when this happens, the temperatures within the star will climb from about 15 million degrees Kelvin to about 100 million degrees Kelvin. The higher temperatures will, will then cause the star's outward layers to expand. The star will then balloon into a red giant. So in about, I think it's about 3 billion years or so, the sun will like, expand out to, the, uh, to a red giant. And it will actually come out as far perhaps as the planet Mars. So the Earth will likely be devoured uh, when, uh, so Mercury, Venus, and the Earth will likely be devoured, and the and the outward envelope of the Sun will come out almost to the orbit of, of Mars. For stars between three and eight solar masses, so now we're talking bigger than the Sun, the core continues to contract, and stars fusing a uh, helium into carbon and hydrogen. At this time, the star shells of burning helium and hydrogen are thrust outward into space at a few miles per second. The ionized layers glow as they interact with dust and gas, as they impact with dust and gas in a surrounding um, uh, universe. And the star's expo exposed core lights it up from inside via ultraviolet radiation. This is called a helium phase. And this process can only last about 10,000 to 20,000 years. And I'll tell you why in just a second. So, the way I think of it is the star is slowly dying, but during this brief helium phase, it's party time. And these are examples of what I'm talking about. These are planetary nebulae, uh, some of the more famous ones. So this is the Dumbbell Nebulae in the constellation Vulpicula. It's about 1,400 light years away. It's about uh, 3.2 light years across, and it's approximately 14,600 years old. Here's the Helix Nebula which uh, has sometimes been called the Eye of Saros. Sometimes you've seen this on the internet. This is in the constellation Aquarius. It's about 10,000 years old. It's one of the closer ones to us, about 790 light years away. And it's just over three light years across. And one of the interesting things is, in some of these, such as the, the dumbbell and the helix, you can see the, what, the white dwarf that's left over. You can see the star that's left over here in the core. So all this matter, all these shells of gas came out of this little star here, and it's being lit up still by ultraviolet radiation from that star. Here's the Owl Nebula in Ursa Major. And then uh, this is the Bug Nebula. You guys see the little bug? See the little antenna and little body? This is in the <laughs> constellation Scorpio. I selected these particular planetary nebulae only to describe to you the differences between them. These all look very different from one another, right? Does anybody have an idea of why they would look so different if the process is so similar? I'll give you guys 30 seconds to respond in the chat. Matt, let me know what they say. Any ideas? Uh, nothing yet. We have to do fast finger here and try to type. <laughs> okay, we got one. We got gravitation, composition, element composition. Um, angle they face us, age. All right. Double star and nearby gravity. Thank you. All right. All of the above is, is correct, but the, the, the closest answer is perspective. And I think somebody said that, right? The angle? Yep. Yeah, that, that's the truest answer of the bunch. But composition is definitely a, a factor as well. So... What we're doing here is, for example, with the Helix Nebula, we're looking at it from above or below, okay? And that's why it's so concentric, like a circle. Um, let's see if I must have it here somewhere. Oh, I took it out. Um, we're seeing this one from above, which is why it's so concentric. The Owl Nebula is also, I believe, uh, from above or below. That's why it's so round. These other ones we're seeing from the side. So this would look more like this if we were seeing it from the side instead of from the top. The bug nebula is actually a double lobe. So think of it as an hourglass shape. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this object. It's a very complicated uh, structure, but there's a central star in here that we can't see because it's being blocked by these layers of, layers of gas. 
Um, but this is a double lobed planetary nebulae, nebula that we're seeing from the side. So I've always thought this is really interesting. Whenever you look at a planetary nebula through a telescope, think about the angle that you're seeing it at because it, it makes all the difference in what you can see. Yeah, and the, in the link I sent for Eta Carina, it, it shows what the 3D structure is and you can kind of visually see then you've got an hourglass shape that if you rotate it, you could see these different perspectives. Cool. Any questions on planetary nebula? Anything I didn't explain properly? Uh, I'm a little curious um, why you have the hourglass shape, why you have two lobes. Do you have a clue? You know, I, I read about it, but I can't remember exactly why that is. It's not the only one that does that. This hourglass shape in planetary nebula is fairly common. I think it has to do, again, with the angle that we're viewing it at. It also, uh, the way I'm thinking about it is, let's say the star is here, and let's say that it, uh, its rotation is this way. So we're seeing it from the side, kind of like the planet Uranus kind of thing, we're seeing it from the side. The matter is accreting outward at, in these axes, hmm. in these directions. So yeah. instead would... of seeing the star with north here, let's say north is here, the matter is being uh, puffed outwards along these lines. Yeah, I thought it might have something to do with the spin axis of the star before it blows up, like is the equatorial thing along the narrow part of the hourglass. Right, exactly. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I, so I, I, the matter is leaving the star in these axes, in these directions. But you'll see not all of them are hourglass, right? Look how uniform the dumbbell is. Sure. Right? So again, a lot of this has to do with perspective and line of sight. A lot of it has to also do with so, somebody had mentioned composition of what these elements are. You know, the heavier ones are going to move more slowly than lighter ones, for example. Uh, this is likely hydrogen and, um, here, hydrogen and helium. And this may be more nitrogen because nitrogen is blue. So composition definitely has, plays a role. Um, in the helix, it's definitely more hydrogen than there is in the, um, in the dumbbell. And in the bug, there's so many different, there's so much going on here. I was reading about this. This is one of the more complicated uh, planetary nebulae structures known. Um, I should also add, the term planetary nebula is an unfortunate name. It has nothing to do with planets. The reason why it's called planetary nebula is because in the early days when, when astronomers had relatively poor telescopes, they would see one of these things and they, saw, they noticed that they had size. They weren't dots like stars, but they had size to them. And to the, in their minds, that reminded them of planets that have what we call disks. These also appear to have disks. So they associated them with planets, which was incorrect, but the name has stuck. So don't think that planetary nebulae have anything to do with planets at all. Yeah, uh, Vaults and Dan said uh, the magnetic field lines are responsible for mm -hmm. the shape. And uh, that yep. makes a lot of sense. Fermi bubbles, I guess. So. Yep. No, that makes sense. I was going to say magnetic lines too. I forgot, but... Yep. So as these as these stars accrete matter, they move out along the star's magnetic field lines, um, and they these magnetic field lines are very um, important in the shape that these objects form. So I would say, to rehash what I said earlier, the angle of viewing is very important, but also the magnetic field lines, the shape of the the shape and structure of the magnetic field lines is probably the second most important feature in the way in the way that we see a planetary nebula. That's a good, that's a good answer. Thank and you for Steve your asks, help. And Steve asks, are planetary nebula emitting or reflecting? What filters are good to use? For planetary nebula, my favorite is to use an oxygen three filter. They're emitting. Um, uh, actually. Well, they're probably right. fluorescing in a sense. They right? are fluorescing. The, the central star, the white dwarf in the center is what's really causing us to be able to see the stuff here. So they are fluorescing. Uh, O3 filter works the best for me. Uh, ultra high contrast or UAC filters are probably second best, uh, but they can dramatically bring out planetary nebulae. A lot of times you can't even see the helix because it's so large. It's the size of our moon in the sky. It's so large, it has such a low surface brightness that unless you're under really dark skies, it can be really hard to find. If you throw in an O3 filter, this thing is, it becomes relatively easy to spot. Any other questions on planetary nebula? Not so far. Okay. So now we've talked about the death of medium to small size stars, right? 
Uh, they don't go out in a blaze of glory. They don't blow up. They don't, and the reason for that is, is because they don't have the mass to create the, the necessary heat and pressure within the core to cause such a reaction. So instead of, of dying in a blaze of glory, they die by puffing off their outer layers and, and they go out into space. And the reason why, the, remember I mentioned that these only last 10 to 20,000 years? And that's because what will happen, let's take the helix, for example. As this expands out into space, uh, the distance between atoms of, of, the, of the shells of gas expand. So they're less likely to collide with matter that they encounter out in space. But also more importantly, they're further away from the white dwarf star, which is helping to fluoresce them from, from within. So they get further away, they expand out, they become harder to see. They're gonna, their surface brightness will become so low at some point that it'll be hardly detectable at all. And this typically lasts about, give or take 20,000 years. So anytime you see a planetary nebula, think about how lucky you are to be able to see that particular object when it's in this phase, because it lasts just an in, a brief instant in, in the scheme of things. The universe is something like 13 billion years old. And these objects only last for 10 or 20,000 years. And we're lucky enough to see them. So we talked about small stars and how they die. How do big stars die? So like the process that form planetary nebulae, supernova occur at the end of a star's life. However, uh, as I mentioned um, a second ago, in order for a star to go supernova, a star has to be much more massive than our sun. Supernova are some of the most powerful explosions found in nature. And, in, and in, on average, about three supernova go off every century, century in our own Milky Way. The last one observed in our galaxy was in 1604, and it was called Kepler's star. Before that, in 1572, Tycho Brahe, a uh, famed Danish astronomer, described Tycho's star, which I think is in the constellation of Cassiopeia. Before that, uh, there was one in Taurus in the year 1054, which resulted in, in what we now call the famous Crab Nebula. So if you've ever been to New Mexico and you've ever visited Chaco Canyon, there is a trail that takes you to where these petroglyphs are. These are created by the, the native Anastasi people. And there, there are, at, I'm gonna say this incorrectly, archeo astronomers that have dated these rock, rock uh, petroglyphs to the year 1054. So there is a belief that, that this was an observation of the supernova in 1054 made by native people. And this is the result of that explosion. This is what the Crab Nebula looks today. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So now I'm gonna get a little bit wonky, a little bit nerdy on you for about three minutes. Hopefully you can withstand that. And if you have questions or if I'm speaking too uh, quickly, just slow me down uh, because this is some important information coming up. There are two different types of, uh, two main types of supernova. There's what we call type one and type two supernova. Type one supernova occur in binary star systems where you have a carbon rich white dwarf star of about 1.44 solar masses uh, siphoning off matter from a larger companion star. So remember we talked about uh, planetary nebulae and what happens to the star after that, they become white dwarfs, they slowly die off. So these are essentially dead stars. They're not uh, giving off uh, fusion anymore. They're not giving off um, energy like a normal star would. These are uh, for all intents and purposes, dead stars. But what happens when they get um, when they're in a binary star system with a larger companion star is that they can start to accumulate matter as it shows here. So this is the large companion star spinning and this little uh, white dwarf has just enough gravity to start pulling in matter, right? And so it, once it pulls in enough matter to have 1.44 solar masses, which is also called Chandrasekhar's limit, the star can actually reignite. Um, so basically what happens is the star uh, is able to, uh, to undergo nuclear fusion again, but now the star can no longer support its weight uh, of all this extra matter that, that it's accumulated. 
eventually the core will collapse inward again and it'll detonate the white dwarf star in a blaze of glory, a huge, what we call a type one supernova. That's why sometimes these white dwarf stars are called zombie stars because they were dead stars that came to life again, if albeit briefly. Now, one of, one of the interesting things that happens with type one supernova is the physics involved in this is uh, extraordinary. Um, as gravity crushes the core, temperatures can exceed 1 billion degrees. So think about that. So again, all this extra matter that came from the companion star is crushing the core of the white dwarf to the point where the core of the white dwarf is a billion degrees. Within a brief amount of time, and sometimes we're talking minutes, heavier elements are created and then ejected into space with an explosion. So what happens is this matter compresses the core and then bounces off. And that bounce off is an explosion that we see as a supernova, okay? And literally some of the heaviest elements that we have in the universe, basically everything north of iron was created in a supernova blast. So you think about all those extra elements, think of all the rare earths, think of all the, the, heavy, the uranium, for example, uh, all, this, all those heavier elements that we have, that we know about today, were created in these brief moments of supernova explosions. Okay, so some characteristics of a type one supernova, they show a strong ionized uh, silicon absorption line in their spectra. These are some, these are typically the brightest of the type one type of supernova, which have these white dwarfs and these companion stars. An interesting thing about these type 1a supernovas is that their peak brightnesses are very consistent. So all type 1a supernova are always, when they, when they, go, when they go supernova, they are as bright as about 5 billion times brighter than the sun, consistently, wherever they are in the universe. And because of that, astronomers can measure distances to galaxies and other far off objects whenever they can detect a type 1a supernova. These are called um, standard candles. And they're used, they've been used for more than 100 years now to, to measure cosmic distances. So type 1a supernovas are very, very important in our ability to measure the size of the universe and, and, um, and gain some other characteristics. Some of the lesser known types of, of type 1 supernovas are type 1b's, which show strong neutral helium lines in the spectra, and 1c's who do not show any strong silicon or, or helium lines. These ones are less, less common. Type 1a's amongst the type 1's are the more common and, and I, I would say the more important ones for our understanding of distances and, and the like. Does anybody have any questions about type 1 supernova? Uh, not seeing anything, uh, Michael Kuiper mentioned that heavy elements can also be created in a neutron-neutron star merger. Yep, that is true. Okay. Type 2 supernova. These are my favorite. Uh, type 2 supernova are the result of a single very massive star, upwards of 50 solar masses, burning through all of their nuclear hydrogen. As they do, the inner crush of gravity creates higher internal temperatures, and the star begins to fuse together successively heavier elements, helium, lithium, all the way to iron. While it is doing this, the star produces enough outward pressure to keep itself, itself relatively stable. Think of the sun, like as it, as it starts to, in a few billion years, as it starts to burn through its heavier elements, it'll expand, but it won't, it won't be too outrageous. It'll be relatively stable. But once it gets to iron, the star cannot produce much more outward force. It can go no further. Iron is the, in terms of a star's evolution, iron is where it's at. The, because um, once, once a star gets to iron, the burning of iron produces no more outward pressure. So remember we talked about stars being basically a battle between outward pressure and inward force of gravity? Well, if there's no inward, outward force of pressure, what's left? Inward force of gravity, right? And that's what we're talking about here. So, um, so all, of this, all, of these, um, all these outer layers crush the core and the core temperatures exceed, um, uh, again, 100 billion degrees or more. Once the core reaches 1.4 solar masses and cannot, um, it cannot compress any further, 
due to something called neutron degeneracy. The neutrons in the core of the of these of these uh, very large stars are now packed so tightly together they cannot physically get any closer. As a result, the star can no longer support its weight and it'll explode in a titanic blast that we see as type two supernova. While detonating, if the star is massive enough, elements even heavier than iron are fused together for a very brief, brief period. Interestingly to me, of the type 1As and the type 2s, type 2s are made from even, uh, come from even bigger stars, right? 50 solar masses. But it's the type 1As that actually still have the higher surface temperatures um, sometimes than the type 2s. Um, and the other thing too that's interesting about uh, I'll hold off on that thought for just a second, but um, another difference between type 1As and type 2s is when a type 2 supernova goes off, virtually all the star's mass is ejected into space. So again, remember I mentioned that uh, almost every element that we have around us, the heavier elements, came from supernova blasts. Uh, more, more accurately, astronomers believe more of it is from a type 2 supernova blast. So there's a belief out there that the sun is maybe a second or third generation star in this vicinity. And that, that means that in our, our past, you know, 10 billion years ago, maybe 8 billion years ago, there was an even larger star here that blew up and gave us the, the elements and compounds that we have today. Once a type 2 supernova does explode, the remaining star, whatever is left over, becomes the core of a, a dead neutron star or a black hole. So I added these little charts down here just to uh, describe to you what's happening. So a normal star fusing, you got um, hydrogen layers, helium and carbon. Uh, now the star is getting ready to, um, to implode. So these layers are pushing down on the core. Once they push down on the core, they can't go any further in, inwards. There's a bounce, a, a rebound effect that rips a, the star apart. And that's what we see here is the star exploding. Um, just before the eruption, this is the way a type two uh, supernova star is, is constructed. You have hydrogen as the outer layer, helium, carbon, neon, oxygen, silicon, and iron in the core. in these very uh, uniform bands around the star. And then they explode and they spill out into space. Any questions about type two supernova? Nothing shown at this moment. Thank you. Um, so a little bit more on type twos. Type two supernova are distinctive because they have strong hydrogen in their spectra that astronomers can measure. These are called the Balmer absorption lines. Another feature of these type two supernovae is they eject vast streams of neutrinos into space just before the main explosion destroys a star. So, so right before the star, be the explosion becomes visible to us, the star ejects a, a vast stream of neutrinos out into space. So there's a very interesting story about how this was proved. That has to do with a, a supernova blast in 1987, the most recent supernova blast in our vicinity of space. And it's been called, it's now called 1987A. And remember, we, I showed you a picture of the tarantula nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It happened right on the edge of the tarantula nebula, about 168,000 light years away. So this blast actually happened about 168,000 light years away, and we were only able to detect it in 1987. So back in 1987, a lot of the, the knowledge and understanding of what happens in the core of very large stars as they die was theoretical, but had not been proven yet. And astronomers didn't really understand a lot of the physical laws that, that govern these explosions or even how to detect them. So what, what some countries did was they built these, these tanks of heavy water, just water. Uh, Japan had them, we had them, the Europeans had them, all in the hope that someday uh, maybe a neutrino uh, would come through and, and bang into an atom of water and give off some, um, some radiation that we could detect. But it was never proved. It, was never, it had never happened, so we weren't sure if it was going to work. Well, lo and behold, I think the date was February 24th, 1987. You guys can check me on that. Um, all of a sudden, there was a detection. I think it was the Japanese detector. It went off in the middle of the night. And it, astronomers didn't know what to do. <laughs> this is before the internet. So 
uh, they thought that maybe the, the detector was malfunctioning. So astronomers started calling around the world to each other and said, hey, uh, our water tank just uh, flashed. Did you guys see something? And then from Utah, there was one that said, yeah, we actually had the same problem. We thought we had a malfunction. And they pieced this together. And within minutes, literally within an hour for sure, there was this broadcast to uh, um, visual astronomers around the world, point your telescopes upwards. There might be a supernova blast coming. And lo and behold, I can't remember how long ago, how long later it was, maybe another hour. So it was approximately two hours after the neutrino detection. Uh, astronomers in the Southern hemisphere looking up at the large Magellanic cloud saw a new star, which became supernova 1987A. And this was a monumental moment in our understanding of supernova because our, our theories on how they um, would eject all these neutrinos into space came true. The detectors worked and, uh, and it, we were able to prove that a supernova was coming even before we were able to see it. So it's one of my favorite astronomy stories. Uh, this is just a, um, a picture of the Balmer lines, the Balmer spectral lines of a type two supernova showing these visible hydrogen lines. Uh, the red line here is hydrogen alpha, which is 656 nanometers. And here are some of the other wavelengths that are, that are prevalent for people that care about these things. So can we see supernova remnants after the fact? Is it possible to see some? Well, yes, here they are. Remember we talked about uh, that almost all the heavy elements we have in the universe came from supernova? Well, what happens is that after the supernova goes off, there's these shock waves that go off into space. And sometimes we can see them. The Veil Nebula is probably the best known example of this. This is in Cygna, Cygnus, and this is a vast ring. This is just one part of the Veil Nebula. There's a vast arc that kind of goes like this. It's about six, six and a half moons wide in our sky up in the constellation of, of Cygnus. Uh, this is uh, one portion of it called the Western Veil. The star just happens to be there. Uh, this has not, 52 Cygni, Cygni is the star. This has nothing to do with the supernova blast. Astronomers believe that the supernova blast occurred about 8,000 years ago and about 2,400 light years away. And we can still see this shock wave going off into space, interacting with other compounds and gases that, in space that were already there. And that's why we can see it. Uh, I'm trying to remember which filter. I believe an O3 works with the veil, but a UHC, I believe, works better for those that have them. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think the UHC is better to see the veil. Remember I showed you guys uh, the picture of this picture here of the Native American uh, petroglyphs in New Mexico? That... This is the Crab Nebula. This is what um, resulted from that blast. Uh, and again, this happened in 1054. This is an image taken by Vaults. The distance to this object is about 6,200 light years. And this is now about 11 light years across. And what's interesting about the Crab Nebula is astronomers have taken images over the years and they've created movies. Amateur astronomers have done this as well. And you can see the Crab Nebula spanning out into space. It'll pass a thousand years, Earth years, uh, in about what, about uh, 34 years, 33 years since this blast occurred. There's all sorts of really interesting physics going on here. Um, I don't have time to talk about it here, but, it, but I just read some information on this. And if anybody's interested, I can describe it a little bit further later. But this is a fascinating object to look at through a telescope. It looks like a very soft glow uh, with some mottled edges. And some, we can see some of these filamentary structures through, our, through the eyepiece. It's really an amazing object. Remember we talked about supernova 1987A? This is the, the remnant as it currently appears from the Chandra, the NASA Chandra uh, X-ray Observatory. This supernova became easily visible to the naked eye, even from 168,000 light years away. When the Crab Nebula blew a thousand years ago, astronomers from Japan, China, uh, Arabian astronomers, European astronomers, we're reporting seeing this in the daytime. This, this nebula became, or this explosion became bright enough that it was about six to 10 times brighter than Venus. And it stayed brighter for that bright for about three weeks or so. And then started to fade away. 
but this was still visible to the unaided eye for almost two years after the explosion. Another interesting difference between type 1A and, and type 2 supernova is that astronomers can tell, like even amateur astronomers can tell which type is which, by just observing them over a period of weeks. Uh, so type 1A supernova tend to peak more brightly than type 2 supernova, about 5 billion times brighter than the sun, but they then stay at that peak for only about two or three weeks, then have a dramatic drop, and then, and then leveling off for a little while, then dropping off again. Type 2 supernova don't quite peak quite as brightly, but they can stay as bright for upwards of two or three months before dropping off. Back in 2016, we, were, we observed from CGO a type 2 supernova in the um, galaxy NGC 6946 that we spent at least three months, maybe four months observing through our amateur telescopes because it stayed about the same brightness. And that's how we knew it was a type 2 supernova. Okay, so I have a question from yeah. Bob. Uh, is there any reason Crab Nebula is classified as M1, Messier 1? Are there any number, do the numbers have significance? Man, I was hoping not to have to share that story. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, he here's the story. So the Messier list, the M stands for Messier. So Charles Messier was a French astronomer uh, living in the late 18th century. And he wanted to become famous. That was his goal in life. He wanted to be uh, famous for discovering comets. Because back, back in the day, if you discovered a comet, you got your name on it. And if it was a periodic comet that kept coming back, your name would be in lights for you know, generations to come. So he wanted that, he wanted that for himself. So he had, a, I think, a four-inch telescope. And he was observing from downtown Paris, essentially. And he started looking around for comets. In 1758, Okay, let me back up again. Uh, in approximately 1682, there was a guy you might have heard of named Isaac Newton. Uh, he teamed up with the astronomer Royale in England, um, Edmund Halley. I think I got this right. And, uh, and, 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 and Halley provided him with observations of a comet and Newton then derived calculus. That's... Um, the long and short of it is from Newton derived calculus to try to explain the orbits of comets and similar types of objects. Halley used this information to predict that this comet that they saw in the late 17th century would come back in the 18th century in approximately 1758. So here's our guy Messier. He's going to find this comet in 1758 and he's going to become famous. He may not get his name on it, but he's going to be in lights because it's a famous, it'd be a famous discovery. Well, the prediction was in 1758 that it would become visible again, approximately in the constellation of Taurus. So, so Messier uh, started looking around in Taurus and lo and behold, what does he run into? The crab, what's now known as the Crab Nebula. He decided to mark its position and its description so that he wouldn't, uh, confuse it again with the comet, that this is a deep sky object, not a comet. And he kept doing this over time. So his list be has become famous as the Messier list, and it contains about 110, 110 of the best, some of the best deep sky objects that we can see from the Northern Hemisphere. M1 is only called M1 because he was out looking for Halley's Comet. <laughs> um, and there's no rhyme or reason to the order of objects in the Messier list. They're all over the sky and in no particular order. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, and then we have a second question. Uh, why does um, the uh, 1987A look like a ring rather than a spherical shell? Uh, somebody want to answer that? We've already covered that, right? Yeah, I think so. It's just like that glowing gas is kind of the shock wave, right? Right, it's the shock wave going off into space. Remember, it's only been, what, 30 years or so. Yeah. And uh, it has to do with our orientation. So we're probably looking at it from, this, from uh, the top or the bottom again. And as I think Vols or somebody else admitted or, or postulated, the magnetic field lines are, are also causing some of this, the way the structure is being viewed by us. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And I'll add that, you know, even if you had a uniform glowing sphere of gas, because you're, you're looking through a sphere, the, the perimeter from your perspective would be brighter anyway, just because there's more gas in it that you're in your- On the outside. Yeah. Yep, yep, that's true. 
All right. So we have, answered the question. Uh, 1987 A, is that a black hole or something else in there? This is going to be a um, likely a neutron star or a black hole. So it, that's actually a really good question. I should have covered this. With type two supernova, where the star was so massive, um, they, they, can, they generally result in either um, the core uh, becoming a neutron star, which is a, a star of approximately 20 miles or so across that has so much mass in it that if you stood on it, you'd weigh million or billions of pounds. Or if you, if, amongst the even bigger stars that blew, um, they generally turn into black holes that uh, we can only detect through um, uh, secondary means. We can't see a black hole visually. Yeah, as, as I recall, the uh, neutron star is the last holdout before a black hole. Once you crush the neutrons down, you're done. Yeah, neutron degeneracy. You can't get, you can't crush them past a certain point. Okay. The great debate in the expanding universe. So, so now we've talked about how stars die, right? So now we talked a little bit about how they're born, how they live, and how they die. Now we're going to start looking out. Remember that diagram of the Milky Way I showed you at the beginning? And we looked at things that were within our galaxy. Now we're going to start getting away from that. We're going to start looking outward, away from our galaxy. So about 100 years ago now, 101 years ago, there was what we call the Great Debate. And it basically shaped 20th century astrophysics. The debate was really how big is the universe and what's, how is it shaped? There was one faction uh, led by Harlow Shapley at Mount Wilson Observatory who believed the universe is one giant nebula about 300,000 light years across. Based, that was based on their observations that there was nothing, there's no way that we can see anything further because we can't measure anything further. There was another group, another faction uh, led by uh, Haber Curtis from Lick Observatory who studied spiral nebulae and believed them to be far, much further away than 300,000 light years. And he called them island universes. There was a, 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 a what they called um, female computers back in the day. Uh, now we'd call them scientists. Uh, there was a lady named Henrietta Levitt who was working at the Harvard, Harvard Observatory. In 1908, she discovered um, what became known as Cepheid variable stars in the Magellanic clouds. These are stars that um, brighten and dim on a very precise uh, interval. Uh, so there are different uh, versions of Cepheid variable stars, but I, I may say this wrong, but I think approximately three to, three to six days or something like that uh, is the period of the average uh, Cepheid variable star. So they were able to, she was able to help prove that these Cepheid variables hold to this no matter where they are. So a close-in Cepheid variable star would, would uh, pulse every, you know, let's say, three days. Farther away, they're also three days. There's no difference. Remember we talked about standard candles with type 1a supernova? Cepheid, var Cepheid variable stars were um, the ultimate uh, standard candle uh, for astronomers 100 years ago. Because now astronomers can look for these Cepheid variable stars in far-off nebulae and using the uh, understanding the direct relationship between their brightness and their luminosity, they create a graph. And using this graph, they could determine the distance to the object based on the type of Cepheid variable that they saw in its period of uh, fluctuation. Using uh, this method pioneered by Hen Henrietta Leavitt, in 1924, Edwin Hubble used the Mount Wilson telescope uh, to confirm that the, the Andromeda galaxy was indeed a separate galaxy. He had, he had found Cepheid variable stars there. And these, these stars were so dim that they must have been far away because of this, uh, this luminosity uh, brightness uh, association. And so using, using his observations, he proved that the universe was much larger than previously thought. So, Ultimately, what he proved was Hebert Curtis was right, that Harlow Shapley was wrong. The universe is not 300,000 light years across. We now know it as what, 13.7 billion light years across or so, right? So this is a revolution in astrophysics. And it opened up our, our understanding of what became galaxies. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about galaxies. 
As mentioned, these were once thought to be fuzzy objects within our own Milky Way, but now we know them to be islands of billions or even trillions of stars, dust and gas, all held together by gravity. Uh, they can be thought of as mega solar systems in that they have multitudes of globular and open clusters. They have nebulae. They even have other galaxies orbiting around them. So in my view, they're almost like self-contained universes. Hubble came up with a classification for galaxies. Uh, he observed spiral galaxies. He observed barred spiral galaxies, and we'll talk about these in a, in a moment. And he also talked, and he also observed elliptical galaxies. He also came up with this peculiar type of galaxy called lenticular galaxies, or SO, as he called them. But we'll talk about those uh, in a minute. And these have characteristics of all three of the other types. I should also mention, let me just back up for a second. Even though Edwin Hubble, who was big into self-promotion, I will say, if you read up on him, he was very much about self-promotion. Even though he became famous for what became known as the expanding universe theory, he was never quite sure that he was right. So if you ever see his writings of the time, it's always phrased with things like, it appears that, or it seems though, or it could be. But he's never, uh, for several years after that, he refused to be pinned down on it, lest he be wrong. So it, it was kind of an interesting side note to how this whole debate went down. Okay. So we talked, we're, talk, we're going to talk about all these different types of galaxies now. Elliptical galaxies. These are perhaps the wide, widest range of any galaxy type. These are, can be from anything from very spherical, roundish um, glows to very elongated, as this is showing. Depending on their class, they can look the same, regardless of whether you're looking down or from the side or anywhere. They all look very uniform. These are, tend to be very old galaxies and have very little extra dust and gas in them to, to create new stars. So these are, even though they can be very large and very old, they, they're essentially dead galaxies. There's very little new star formation going on in elliptical galaxies. Through a telescope, these, star, these galaxies tend to look very yellow. And the reason for that is because young, hot stars tend to be blue. If they're not creating young, hot blue stars, what's left over are these yellow stars that tend to congregate um, closer to the center of these halos. They contain uh, relatively low amounts of heavier elements as well. Uh, this is also related to the fact that uh, they have very low star formation. Um, and they tend to be surrounded by huge swarms of globular clusters. And um, we'll talk about uh, one particular one in a moment. Uh, giant elliptical galaxies can be, can be some of the largest galaxies known. They're the result of countless mergers of galaxies over time. Because of their immense gravity, large elliptical galaxies can usually be found near the centers of galaxy clusters. Just a second. And here's some examples of, of elliptical galaxies. M87, which was in the news again this week, uh, this is the only uh, galaxy which has had its black hole uh, visually uh, identified, uh, observed. And it's in the news again this week um, because the earlier image two years ago was an unpolarized light. And the mo more recent image shows it with in polarized light, which gave a better view of its intensely strong magnetic field. M87 is one of the largest galaxies um, in our vicinity. Um, remember I said our Milky Way was about 120,000 light years across? In total, M87 is close to a million light years across. It's about 55 million light years away. Our Milky Way contains on, on the order of 200 billion stars. M87 contains over a trillion stars. Our Milky Way contains about 150 globular clusters. M87 contains 13,000 globular clusters. So you get the idea, right? It's really big. And it's uh, classified as an EO because it just looks like a big spherical ball. There's no rhyme or reason to the shape. It's just, when you look at it from one angle or another, it, it just looks like a big ball. This blue line, by the way, is a jet emanating from, from the black hole at the core of this galaxy. 
I've seen it once or twice through very large telescopes. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen this jet. It's, I believe it's the only jet that we can actually see visually in another galaxy. Uh, if, remember I mentioned that uh, large elliptical galaxies tend to be at the center of galaxy clusters. This is a famous galaxy cluster called Markarian's Chain in Virgo. It's approximately 23 galaxies all in a tight, um, tight arrangement. At the core of them is M84 and M86, uh, these two very large elliptical galaxies that each contain over 500 billion stars. Uh, and these are in the order of you know, 52 to 66 million light years away. Any questions on elliptical galaxies? Oh, let's see. I think I just got one here. Uh, I have to read it live here. Vesto Melvin Slifer of, Slifer. Yep. of the Lowell Observatory was first to measure the recessional velocities of galaxies in 1914 mm -hmm. with a 24-inch refractor and lacked the large telescope needed to measure their distance. Yep. Yeah, Slifer is involved in the uh, great debate with the other astronomers I mentioned. Um, he, uh, he also teamed up, I believe, with Edwin Hubble uh, to be able to measure these, um, these distances. And he helped to come up with the theory of the expanding universe and how galaxies are seem to be moving away from us. He was one of the, uh, the chief architects of that theory. Spiral galaxies. I get in trouble for saying this. I know that, but I don't care. But to me, when you look at a spiral galaxy, they look like giant hurricanes. Uh, they have intricate spiral arms and a glowing core of older stars. They're, they're so beautiful to me, especially through an eyepiece. I mean, you can see the spiral structure in a galaxy like M101 or M51 in Canis Venatici. Uh, these, are, these really do look to me like island universes, don't they? Uh, these, these galaxies differ greatly from elliptical galaxies in that, remember I mentioned elliptical galaxies do not have a whole lot of excess gas. Uh, they're not creating new stars on a large scale. Spiral galaxies do, uh, and particularly in the spiral arms. So if you remember some of my earlier pictures, uh, we, we talked about how globular clusters, are, um, sorry, H2 regions, so let me rephrase that. Uh, there are associations of H2 regions in the spiral arms of, of, of galaxies where new stars are being formed. And we looked at a couple of them in M33 and uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, these, these, are, these are examples, other examples of H2 regions in spiral galaxies. These brighter areas here that you see, let's see if I can find one, there's some here. These brighter patches are areas of, of, of high concentrations of hydrogen gas. And these are where new stars are being formed. And this is, a, a, and spiral galaxies are a primary engine of new star formation. Because of the hypercenter of these hot, young, blues, bluish stars, these spiral galaxies can have a bluish tinge to them. Uh, and these spiral arms particularly, you see that? Most of their matter resides outwards along the plane of the core. I think, what'd you call it, Matt? Uh, egg skillet, what'd you call it? Fried egg and a skillet. Yeah, fried egg is a skillet. I call it a basketball with like wings. So one of the interesting things about spiral galaxies, remember we talked about planetary nebula, what's really important is the orientation. For spiral galaxies, the orientation is also important. So for these two galaxies, we're looking at them from basically the top down, right? Or maybe the bottom up. And that's why we can see the open face as they call it. And you can see the beautiful spiral pattern, right? Some other galaxies we see at different orientations. So what they call SA galaxies are these tightly wound uh, galaxies. They have smooth spiral arms and large bright cores. <clears throat> SBs are, are slightly less tightly wound and have a bluish, um, tinge to their spirals. SCs are more loosely wound and have a faint central core and have clearly resolved clusters in, or in nebulae in orbit around them. And here's other examples. So here's uh, what they call the fireworks galaxy, NGC 6946. Uh, you can see the reddish areas in here. This, this galaxy is, is uh, designated what's called a starburst galaxy. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But basically what to give you a, a snapshot is this galaxy would have interacted with another galaxy in the recent past. And as a result, some of its, its gas has been stretched and, uh, and altered um, gravitationally. As a result, it's heated up. And when it heats up, 
these areas could undergo brief instances of super intense star formation. And a lot of stars are being formed and some of these stars are gonna be very massive, okay? And massive stars last, their lives are much shorter than smaller stars. And because this galaxy has had so many new stars formed in, in, in recent um, eons, some of them being very large, th this galaxy is the most pr uh, predominant maker of supernova, supernovae that we've seen in the last hundred years. We've seen nine supernovae in this one galaxy and it's the most we've seen in any galaxy. Um, the next two, I think M61 and I can't remember, M61 is tied with another one for sixth. So these are galaxies that are um, making lots of stars, some of which are very large. And since very large stars die sooner, we see them as supernova. So a little bit of an aside to the fireworks galaxy. Here's a lovely picture by Nick Hartman of the Andromeda galaxy. It's another sp spiral galaxy, 2.2 uh, million light years away. Uh, interestingly, so this galaxy is on a collision course with our Milky Way. So in approximately 2 billion years, it's going to collide and will ultimately swallow us up. So it'll be one big larger galaxy. The, remember I said the Milky Way is about 120,000 light years across? This is about 220,000 light years across. There appears to be an upper limit to galaxies, spiral galaxies. Remember I said like uh, elliptical galaxies can be almost a million light years, maybe even more than a million light years wide. You, I have not found spiral galaxies exceeding about 220, 250,000 light years across. So there may be something to that where they just can't get any, any larger than this. I don't know that for fact, but I, it seems to be that way. Well, two other examples. Remember we talked about orientation with spiral galaxies? So these two we're looking from above. This one's basically from above. This one's kind of from maybe halfway to the side. Now look, edge on. So remember I said it looked to me looked like a basketball with wings? This is my example. <laughs> this is called the needle galaxy. And if you ever get a chance to see this under a dark sky, it's amazing to see. You, you can see this dark lane going through it. And we can see the central bulge like this. Then finally, here's a southern pinwheel galaxy. This is a picture I took uh, three weeks ago. And if you look closely, you'll see some bluish spiral arms here. This is a tightly wound galaxy. It's an SA type. Um, if you look closely, there's some reddish regions in here. These are the areas of new star formation. So this is a beautiful galaxy. And they call it the southern pinwheel because of the uh, spiral pattern, so obvious and easy to see. I have a couple questions. Uh, the question is, is the age of the spiral galaxy related to the letter, like SA is older, SC is younger, or vice versa? And I think what you're, it seems like he's asking is, do they kind of wind tighter and tighter over time? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't know the precise answer to that. My initial instinct was to say no. They have nothing to do with age. So what happens with these spiral galaxies, I think, I tend to believe that a lot of these spiral galaxies tend to be tighter wound. And what happens over time is they interact with other galaxies. So like when I, what I should have described M M51 as, this is actually two galaxies. This is called NGC 5195. And this is M51, the big uh, spiral galaxy. What do you guys notice here? M51 is eating NGC 5195. It's interacting with it. And over time, there's a bridge of matter here that it, this big galaxy is siphoning, siphoning off matter from the small galaxy and causing a mess, as you can see. I think what happens over time is these spiral galaxies interact with other galaxies. And when they do, they lose some of their tightly wound structure as the other galaxy's gravity pulls on these spiral arms. And that helps to make them less tightly wound. That might not be true in all cases, but I, I'm pretty sure that th that does happen. Uh, and I think that's a, at least a partial answer to that question. Okay. Then there's a question of, is there a significance of the A, B, or C being uppercase or lowercase like you show on your- Yeah, there is. I'm not, you know, I was hoping nobody would ask that because I <laughs> don't quite know the answer to that. These are subclassifications within each one of these. So the way I take this one is it's tightly wound, Middle, middle ground of the tightly wound. So it'd be SAA would be the tightest wound. SAB would be 
pretty tightly wound. And the SAC would be less tightly wound of the tightly wound, if that makes sense. There's just some, some classifications, nothing to do with age, uh, nothing to do with anything except for their appearance. Cool. And, any other questions? Not yet, no. Great. So we talked about spiral galaxies. Cousins to the spiral galaxies are barred spiral galaxies. And these look very similar to regular spiral galaxies in that, uh, to me, they look like giant hurricanes. I know I'll get in trouble for saying that. Um, they have beautiful spiral arms that, can, that contain star forming regions, just like in spiral galaxies, and a glowing core of older stars and large amounts of undetectable dark matter. The only way we, can, we know the dark matter is there is that without it, there's not enough mass to coincide with the observed um, the appearance of the galaxies. The main difference between spiral and barred spiral galaxies is that these barred spirals also contain a bar-like structure at their coming off their core, uh, which extend out many thousands of light years and end at where the spiral structure begins. Astronomers aren't entirely certain as to why the bars form, but it, they believe that they, that they help to funnel matter from the outer portion of the galaxy and the spiral arms inwards towards the galactic core where there's likely a, a big black hole uh, to, so it can feed on it. It does Hubble classification system for a barred spiral is very similar to uh, that of the regular spiral words uh, where we had SA, SB and SC. Now we have SBA, SBB, SBC. And you can see basically the structure differences, you know, more tightly wound, less tightly wound, et cetera. Our Milky Way, by the way, is believed to be an SBB. So our Milky Way is classified as a barred spiral and is, and is um, thought to look like this. Here's some examples, some barred spiral galaxies. Look, you can see the bar. Do you see that? It's not a core and then spiral structure. There, there appears to be a bar. If you guys can see that in some of these galaxies. SEM91. Uh, NGC 2903 in LEO, and then the Fornax galaxy, NGC 1097. One thing I want to add here, remember we talked about globular clusters? We went from open clusters being uh, 100 light years, 1,000 light years, 2,000 light years away. Then we went to globular clusters, 25,000, 15,000 light years away. Look at these galaxies now, 51 million, 30 million, 48 million. If I go back here. You know, 2.2 million, 22 million, 39 million. Now we're peering out away from the, what I, what I, the way I think of it as the Milky Way is the city. So if you're familiar with the, the Twin Cities Metro, I, I live near Eden Prairie. I think of it as when you, when you live in Eden Prairie and you look towards the glow of Minneapolis in the night sky, think of that as the Milky Way. And then you turn around and you face like Chaska and, and outwards it's less of a glow, right? You're looking away from the city lights. And because we're looking away from the city lights, we don't have the, the gas and the dust to block our view. We can look so much further out into space. And that's why we can see these galaxies, if that makes sense. So we covered um, elliptical, spiral, and barred spiral galaxies. The next type is these strange lenticular galaxies, the SOs, that have characteristics of the ellipticals, the spirals, and the barred spirals. They're kind of like where everything meets on the, uh, the chart that uh, Edward Hubble created. Like ellipticals, they have bright central bulges and no, uh, little or no spiral structure. They also don't have many star forming regions. So these are essentially more or less dead galaxies. Um, and when viewed from a certain angle, they look almost exactly like these EOs, <laughs> just big elliptical balls. Um, but like spirals, when they're viewed ed edge on, they can have some prominent dark lanes. And like barred spirals, they have a hint of a bar structure near the core. So they kind of are at the crossroads of all three of these types of galaxies. And here's some examples. Centaurus A, also called um, uh, the Centaurus radial galaxy. Um, it's about 12 million light years away. And it's about 90,000 light years across. And it's a fantastic object. It's also called the hamburger galaxy because through a telescope, and I just saw this a few weeks ago, basically what it looks like is a big dark lane through the center and then two uh, lobes of the central core, one below and one above. 
it look these look like the hamburger buns and this looks like the meat <laughs> and that's why they call it the hamburger galaxy some people see it i know of at least one person that i that i'm friends with who does not think it looks like a hamburger i think it does look a like hamburger i don't know but this this galaxy is famous for its really strong radiation and x-ray and in particular really radio emissions uh, this is one of the very first radio galaxies discovered uh, in the 50s or 60s, I believe. Um, and it's the result of a collision that the, the main galaxy had with another galaxy in the not too distant past that just created this mess and all this havoc that's going on. It's uh, fascinating. If you ever get a chance to read up on this galaxy, the physics behind what's going on here is amazing. And then again, the Fornax A galaxy um, NGC 1316, it's about 67 million light years away. And look how big this one is, 261,000 light years across. They classify this as also a cross between elliptical spiral and barred spiral or, or a lenticular galaxy. Okay, I, I just wanted to give you a time check. We got about 20 minutes till three o'clock. Okay. Uh, you were talking about going longer than that, but I just thought I'd give you a you know, heads up on that if you're interested. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I think I'll probably end up going maybe another 30 if that's okay for people. I'll try to keep it to 30 or, or so. Um, regular galaxies. Uh, these are galaxies with no definable shape. So they don't look like uh, spirals. They don't look like even the elliptical galaxies. These galaxies got their shapes, their strange shapes because of collisions or interactions with other galaxies. They are chaotic in appearance with no defined central bulge or spiral structures. And they, they, they are thought to, be, uh, to make up roughly 25% of all galaxies that are known. Unlike dwarf galaxies, which we'll cover in a second, regular galaxies have a large amount of excess gas and dust and have many active star formation regions and lots of young stars. Uh, I'll ask a question here real quick. Why do these, dwarf, why do these small regular galaxies have such a large amount of gas and dust. I'll give you guys 30 seconds. Anything, Matt? Not yet. Okay. I've already given you the answer, actually. It's because of these collisions and gravitational attractions with other galaxies that caused them to look like this in the first place. I mentioned it with uh, the fireworks galaxy. What happens is when it interacts with another galaxy, it's, uh, its gas gets stretched. And when its gas gets stretched, it gets heated. And when it gets heated, uh, it, it, is, it becomes primed for new star formation. And that's what's happening in these regular galaxies. Some of these, um, they have various types as well, as do other galaxies. So type one or regular galaxies have some basic structure, but not quite enough to classify a spiral. And type twos don't have any structure. There's a subcategory called dwarf irregular. Um, they, they're believed to be some of the uh, examples of some of the earliest galaxies that populated the universe after the Big Bang. Um, these typically also have high levels of gas, but low levels of metals. And they're not exactly sure why. And our final classification of dwarf galaxies, uh, of galaxies is dwarf galaxies. This is the most predominant type of galaxy in the known universe. They can be some of the smallest galaxies. And they also can be subclassified as elliptical, spiral, or irregular. The average dwarf galaxy is only about 1% the size of our Milky Way and might just contain a few hundred million or maybe a few billion stars. Uh, they often are found in orbit around larger parent galaxies and their shapes and structures can be defined by their interactions with their parents or other galaxies. Our Milky Way has at least 20 known dwarf galaxies around it. Most are hard or impossible to see. Uh, and as I mentioned early on, Omega Centauri, that big globular cluster we saw earlier, uh, may in fact have been the core of an ancient dwarf galaxy that was torn apart by our Milky Way. And here's perhaps the most famous dwarf galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud in Dorado. Again, this cannot be seen from here. I took this picture in Zimbabwe uh, about a year and a half ago. This galaxy is about 160,000 light years away, and it's about 14,000 light years across. So remember we talked about our Milky Way being about 120,000 light years across. Um, and uh, so this is approximately one-tenth as wide as our Milky Way, give or take. And it contains maybe 1% of this number of stars uh, as our Milky Way does. This is another dwarf galaxy, Barnard's galaxy in Sagittarius. Believe it or not, this big ball, this, this 
strange looking mass lump is a, is a dwarf galaxy. And I think I read that this has about 200 million stars in it. So it's another interesting galaxy. This is Sagittarius. It's about 1.6 million light years away and only 7,000 light years across. So this is even half the size of this. And just touching briefly on other galaxy types. Uh, interacting galaxies are, are galaxies formed by the near misses of, of galaxies as they come close to each other. During these passbys, the gas and dust might be exchanged, triggering star formation and sometimes intense star formation. Uh, gravitational attraction can severely distort the shape and structure of these interacting galaxies. And when the angular momentum is not fast enough to let these galaxies you know, zoom past each other, they can end up merging into one bigger galaxy. If one of the galaxies is much larger than the other, this interaction is called cannibalism. Uh, the larger galaxy stays relatively in intact, but the other one is torn apart. And we saw that with M51 back here. So this one is, is getting torn apart by the much larger one. And it's creating this mess I described earlier. Um, and I think I mentioned, oops, sorry, we talked about that. Um, the Milky Way is, is presently cannibalizing two of its dwarf, dwarf galaxies, one in Sagittarius and one in Canis Major. And these are two interactive galaxies that I, that I took pictures of. Uh, this is called um, ARP 271. It's in Virgo and it's about 130 million light years away. This larger galaxy is about 100, 113,000 light years across. And this one is close to 100,000 light years across. And you can see the interaction right here. I just, when I, when I saw the results of this picture, I was amazed that you could see this as clearly, these, these bridges. And then these are the antenna galaxies in Virgo. These are, this is a more, more popular interacting pair. They're about 80 million light years away. And one is about 100, almost 130 light years across. The other one's almost 70 light years across. And you can see what happens when they interact. The gravity from them, from each other, basically uh, distorts their structure and throws out matter. Can you guys see this? This is why it's called the antenna galaxies. These are the antenna. Can you guys see that? And you can see what's happening even um, near the center. You see this reddish area between them. There's some violent activity going on here where they're interacting and, and potentially merging. I lied. I have one more slide on galaxies. Uh, starburst galaxies. I touched upon this a little bit earlier with a, with a fireworks galaxy, but, this, but these galaxies are usually associated with emerging um, or um, other interactions between other, more than one galaxy. They have reserves of gas that form giant molecular clouds within them. And that's connoted here by the, these reddish areas in the Cigar Galaxy M82. These clouds undergo intense star formation, highly accelerated rate. This exceptional rate of starbursts can only be maintained for about 10 million years or so. Otherwise, the galaxy just runs out of gas too quickly. 10 million years might seem a long time, but in the age of the universe, it's a wink. So what will happen is this, this galaxy in just you know, 10 million years or less will form thousands, maybe millions, maybe hundreds of millions of new stars because it passed close to another galaxy and that other galaxy tugged on it and heated up um, its gas in, in particular um, you know, spiral arms or, or what have you. And these, these heated gas areas are now popping stars like you know, popcorn in a microwave. These galaxies, like I mentioned, have many H2 regions, these hydrogen-2 regions, where, these, where massive stars are emitting huge amounts of radiation. So let me, let me say, let me just back up a second. What's happening here is in these reddish areas, some huge stars are being formed, young bluish stars. These stars then radiate their surrounding uh, space with high amounts of UV and, UV and other radiation that makes their surrounding space very agreeable to even further star formation. Uh, again, I, I bring up the uh, throwing a, a bag of popcorn in the microwave. What happens? They just start to pop, right? When these massive stars go supernova, the nearby gas is battered and excited by the shock wave and the intense radiation, further exacerbating this new star formation. And then finally, we talked about all the different kinds of galaxies. The only one other point I'd like to make is that galaxies tend to be found in clusters. Galaxies don't like to be alone. They, they're not like solitary creatures like some of us are. 
Uh, galaxies like to be in families of maybe a few or a hundred or thousands of them held together by gravity. The majority uh, of the gravity holding these clusters together is provided by dark matter. And again, I'll say this for the third or fourth time, astronomers have never directly seen or measured dark matter. They've only indirectly measured it via the, the interaction forces within um, clusters or within galaxies, because without them, th there's not enough mass to hold these things together. The Milky Way is part of the local group galaxy cluster. It contains 54 uh, galaxies to date, and most of them are dwarf galaxies. The local group is about 10 million light years across. And there's three main galaxies at the core, the Andromeda galaxy, the Triangulum galaxy, and our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, other nearby galaxy clusters include the Virgo, Fornax, Hercules, and Coma Berenices clusters. And here's some uh, examples of galaxy clusters. This is Markarian's chain again, a uh, picture by Dave Venny. Uh, I showed you a similar picture, I think. It was my picture earlier, but this is Dave Venny's. So here's M84 and M86, two big elliptical galaxies that are the anchor, and then some smaller galaxies that are interacting gravitationally. Uh, so there's one cluster. And then here's the LEO triplet, which is easy to see in telescopes. Um, these three galaxies are also held together by gravity in a small cluster. And I'd like to just mention on the previous slide, if you could, uh, that these spherical shaped stars that you see there, those are in our galaxy. Um, yes. In the galaxy itself, you're not gonna see individual stars unless you might see a supernova or a CFID variable or something like that. They'd have to stand out. But uh, just so you don't, you know, you're not thinking that the individual stars there are part of that galaxy's cluster or anything like that. Thanks, Matt. I should have mentioned that myself. Yeah, these are foreground stars in our own galaxy that are not part of this galaxy. So returning to galaxy clusters, here's some other examples of galaxies that are in these close-knit uh, communities, as it were. This is Stefan's Quintet, which is, I think it's actually, it's Quintet, but I believe there's six galaxies, all in this really tight, uh, confined area. They're all about 320 million light years away. So they must be really close to each other. And you can see the gravitational influences of, on them on each other, right? Look at this. See, this one's shape is distorted. You can see this uh, looks like a tadpole almost, right? With this tail. Um, so this is a famous uh, galaxy um, cluster in the constellation Pegasus. <clears throat> Other examples of galaxy clusters. These, these two pictures were taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this first one is from what they call the deep field image. Uh, this was taken in 1995. It was just an experiment. So they pointed the deep, um, the deep field camera on the space telescope at a relatively barren part of sky in Ursa Major. I can't remember exactly how long this exposure was. I wanna say this was about 10 hours, give or take, of, of exposure time. They were just curious to see what they would find. It turns out that this relatively barren part of sky in this little small area covering only 2.6 light year, uh, arc minutes squared has 3,000 galaxies they counted. Just in this little, th this normally would be devoid of anything, but with longer exposure, they were able to see 3,000 galaxies. This was such an important find for cosmologists that they decided to try it again a few years later. So this is a 95, here we are eight years later, these, this is 800 exposures taken over 11.3 days by Hubble in an even tighter area. So this is 2.6 arc minutes square. This is 200 arc seconds a square. So much smaller field. With a longer exposure, they found 10,000 galaxies in this one little field. So they think that they're just scratching the surface on, the, on what they know about the density of galaxies in the universe that there must be even a vast number more than they could even imagine at this point. And this, this basically proved it. And, and Nancy asked a question about the James Webb telescope and after it launches, how long do you think it'd be before we start getting back some new information? So I have my fingers crossed on the James Webb. Uh, it is, it's a very complicated telescope and there's a lot that has to go right on launch and on um, the deployment. Uh, and a lot of the technologies that are being used to build and launch and deploy the James Webb are new. So I am, I'm really nervous about that whole thing and how that's going to work out. But I would suspect you within about six weeks, because I, I recall Hubble, it was about six weeks or so before they started uh, doing the testing, the test images, the calibration images. 
Um, they may have done it a little bit sooner than that, but I would say it'll probably be a month or two before they're done deploying everything, checking everything out. Uh, I know that they've already got their primary test targets identified. I don't think they've released what they're going to be, but I remember there was a big to-do about that several years ago. So I think they already have their first targets identified. So hopefully it won't be too long after launch, but my fingers are definitely crossed that it, it launches and uh, deploys successfully. So remember we talked about galaxies being millions, you know, maybe even billions of light years away. So now we're going to the furthest reaches of the universe to things um, called quasars. Uh, quasars or quasi-stellar, that's where the name came from, are some of the most distant objects that we know of. Most are over 10 billion light years away. We can only see them because they're, they're immense emitters of electromagnetic radiation, the largest known in the universe. The average quasar puts out uh, enough radio uh, signals and visible light of 100 Milky Way galaxies. So basically one quasar would equal the output, the energy output of 100 Milky Way galaxies. Quasars are thought to be a step in the evolutionary scale of galaxies undergoing collisions. They have they call them supermassive black holes. I would call these ubermassive black holes at their centers. These black holes interact with cores of nearby galaxies and consume them, which is why they have this, um, this consumption of the cores of other galaxies and what gives them their uber energy outputs uh, that we can see and measure. The average quasar eats the equivalent of 10 stars every year. So these are massive eaters, and that's how, and it's this, 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 this consumption that gives off um, enough energy or consumes enough energy that we can see the radiation um, as these super bright quasars. Eventually, after the supermassive black hole has absorbed all of the matter um, in the um, unfortunate galaxy uh, that ventured too closely, the quasar dies out, leaving a less energetic galactic nucleus. Uh, astronomers have detected more than 200,000 known quasars. However, just a few are bright enough to, for amateurs to see. Uh, one is in Virgo I, I, I saw many years ago called 3C273. It is close by quasar standards, uh, about 2.4 billion light years away. And it puts out the energy of about 4 trillion suns. So think about that. So our Milky Way galaxy is thought to have about 200 billion stars. This one quasar puts out the energy equivalent of 4 trillion stars. So what is that, five, 20 times more? So there's a one or two other ones, uh, other quasars that amateurs can see, but most of these are, are too far away. It must be detected by very large uh, instruments. So we've covered basically all the various kinds of deep sky objects. Hopefully you've got an understanding now of what they are and how they're different from each other and some examples of, of which that you can now try to find your, uh, on your own. Um, if you want to start with some good beginner lists uh, to find deep sky objects, these are the two that I would recommend. The Messier list, if you remember Charles Messier, was that guy that wanted to be famous and created that list of 110 deep sky objects. Uh, some, most of these are some of the, the best deep sky objects that we have uh, from the, that we can see from the Northern Hemisphere. I gave you guys a story. Somebody asked a question about um, Charles Messier or, or gave you the story. Uh, he's the guy that wanted to become famous by finding comets. Now, he, now he's famous for this list of objects. Um, and one of the reasons why this, this list is so great is it contains pretty much every kind of object that we discussed. Uh, emission, reflection, and planetary nebulae, open and globular star clusters, star clouds, dark, I should have mentioned dark nebulae, uh, galaxies, obviously, and supernova remnant. Um, Unfortunately, messy objects are not numbered in orderly fashion. They're basically listed in the order of discovery. So one might be on one part of the sky and one might be in another part of the sky. One might be really far north while another might be very far south. And for you, those of you with binoculars, uh, there are variants of the messy list for you as well as obviously for telescope versions. Um, I would say probably in the order of 20 or so, messy objects are visible to the unaided eye under a dark sky. Um, and if you want some more information, there's a link here that um, will be on the recording if you want it. I found this link. More recently, uh, a new list came up called the Caldwell list, 
So Messier found 110, or he's, he's given credit for 110 of the best deep sky objects that we have, but there are more really good objects out there that are not on his list that either he somehow missed or he just didn't see. Um, so in the 1990s, there was an astronomer named uh, Sir Patrick Moore in England who created what he called the Caldwell list. And he didn't want to call it since he's Moore and there was already Messier, he didn't, he didn't want his list to also have a, you know, an M before it. So he used his middle name, which is Caldwell, which I kind of chuckle at. But it's another list of 109 more deep sky objects that I, I think is a, comp a complementary list to the Messier list. So start with the Messier list. And once you get through that, go to the Caldwell list. One of the benefits to the Caldwell list is it's very well ordered. It's ordered by declination north to south. So you can, the, the first Caldwell um, objects are really far north. And the last ones are really far south. Unfortunately, approximately 40-ish of the 109 objects are too far south for us to see in Minnesota. So you got to travel further south to see the entire list. And there's a link to um, uh, the Astronomical League where they have a listing of the Caldwells. I should also mention that if, you're, if you want to get into observing and you want to have different types of objects to or a list to, to look for, go to the Astronomical League, uh, www.astronomical.org. They have lists of more than 100 lists of different types of deep sky objects that you can try to find, whether they be double stars or um, you know, me uh, the Messier list or Caldwell list or particular kinds of galaxies, globular clusters, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it runs the gamut of everything. And it's a great way to get into the, the hobby and to learn how to find some of these objects. Finally, this is our upcoming B6 schedule for 2021. Um, on Saturday, there's a, a change here I want to bring up. Our next presentation will be on April 17th at 1 o'clock. Steve Emmert's going to be uh, discussing um, astronomical terms. Uh, originally, we had uh, Bob Kerr in the slot, but um, there was a conflict, so Steve Emmert's going to do this one. And then after that, we go outside for the rest of the summer and fall. Um, the first observing session is tentatively scheduled for Eagle Lake Observatory on, on April 24th. I say tentatively because the weather can be iffy, um, but you can plan on that. And after that, hopefully we'll be back to our regular home at Metcalf uh, near Afton on these dates. And, our, and the schedule will be on our um, MAS form as well. Uh, typically our observing sessions are on Saturday nights with Fridays being backup. Uh, this one had to be moved to Friday because we have a public night already at ELO the following Saturday. So uh, if you have any questions, you can email me or give me a call or check the BSIG forum for, for updates as we get closer to each of these events. So with that, any questions? I don't see any questions. I had a comment about the BSIGs. Would you be okay to just describe what would happen at the um, BSIGs out in the field? What kind yeah. of thing to expect there? Sure. So basically what we do with the observing sessions, we keep this very, um, I'll say low key and relatively, um, unstructured with, in terms of the agenda on purpose. The, these events are basically designed for people who just wanna learn about astronomy. It's a way of welcoming you to the Minnesota Astronomical Society. There's no cost, everybody's invited. You can bring your children. Hopefully now COVID is about on its way out, right? Hopefully everybody gets vaccinated. And so the restrictions on the number of people we can invite, um, hopefully will start to uh, be diminished and eventually go away. So basically what we do is, what I say to people is if you have a telescope, bring it. If you have binoculars, bring it. Uh, we'll show you the night sky. You'll learn about the constellations. If there's any planets out, we'll show you the planets. Um, we have, we'll bring our own telescopes, um, our volunteers. So if you don't have one, uh, don't worry. Just come out and look through ours. But ideally, this is a way for you to immerse in, in the beginning of your journey through astronomy and to learn how to use your own telescope. Maybe you've had a telescope in the closet for many years. Uh, bring it out. We'll help you set it up. We'll help you learn how to use it um, and, and uh, help you to find things via star hopping and learning the constellations, et cetera. So it's just a way of uh, inviting new people into our club uh, in a very low key and uh, very easy way. Yeah, and I'd recommend if you are bringing out some equipment, you're, or even if you're not, come out before the sun goes down and um, we can have a little time to talk and show you stuff in the daylight. 
yeah, usually I ask people to arrive about an hour before sunset for that very reason. So people can set up in daylight, ask questions, meet each other, and uh, maybe we can start the night um, you know, once sun sets. Any other questions? Uh, no, just some thank yous, uh, Suresh, uh, for a great presentation. What else you got going here today? Uh, very cool. Oh boy, I did that in two hours and five minutes. That's my record. <laughs> I see a comment from, uh, I can't see the name there, but my son is 13, has a fun new telescope. Bring him out. Let's, uh, well, let's learn how to use this telescope together. Will uh, be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm hey, sorry I missed that comment, yes. Anybody else have any questions or comments or anything that I missed? So um, thank you guys for all for coming. I know Matt has been recording this. Uh, Matt, are you gonna, when do you think you'll post the recording? Uh, it will be probably sometime this weekend. So it should be online uh, as of, i um, gonna try for Monday. Good deal. So the next couple of days, look for a link to this presentation on the Emmaus forum on the BSIG page. And if any, again, if anybody has any questions or comments or you have a question about astronomy or about your telescopes or what have you, just drop me a note and uh, I'll try to answer for you. Yeah, and it would also be in our YouTube channel labeled as such. Yes, that's true. There is an MAS YouTube channel. Matt, um, how do you find our YouTube page? Just type in, uh, in the search for YouTube, just type in Minnesota Astronomical Society, and we've got playlists for our monthly meetings and our B6. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. That's a great ad for our club. Yeah. Yeah, and if you are not a subscriber, if you just go to that uh, channel, the first thing you'll see is our introductory YouTube video, which is really a great video. It kind of gives you a broad overview about the club and shows you some of the sites that we are, you know, observatory sites and stuff like that. <laughs> Very cool. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you guys all for coming. Again, our next uh, presentation will be on the 17th. Uh, Steve Emmert will be uh, presenting on understanding astronomical terms. So look for that on the forum or drop me a note if you have any questions. Thank you, everybody.